OK, welcome to the final week of class this semester. Uh, so today we're taking a look at World War I poetry from British poets Siegfried Sassoon and Wilfred Owen. Let's take a look at the questions. Question one. Why do you think the rearguard begins with a time and place? What effect might this have? What might be different without this line? OK, so let's take a look at this poem. Huh, I thought I could hear someone's microphone. OK, uh, let's take a look at this poem, the rear guard. So a rear guard is the part of the army that stays behind to make sure that the enemy does not attack from behind. Um, but in this case, this title is ironic, I think. Uh, what we have here is a soldier who is, uh, it looks like he has been left behind as maybe as part of a rear guard or maybe his unit has simply moved on and he got lost or forgotten. And so here, this is his journey to catch up with his unit. Uh, and his journey goes through a tunnel. So last week we talked about trench warfare, fighting, uh, digging a long hole in the ground. And sometimes in the trench you will have tunnels. Uh, first of all, because it's easier to get from one place to another using a tunnel. Uh, and secondly, because when the artillery hits from the sky, if it's an open air trench, uh, you will still get hurt by the, the bombing. But if you're in a tunnel, you have a better chance of surviving. So there are, are often tunnels in the trench systems during the war. So he's uh, he's going through a tunnel. He has a torch. Torch in British English means flashlight. So he has a flashlight. Uh, it's dark. Usually tunnels will have some sort of lighting, but if he's been left behind, then maybe the lighting has been turned off. So he only has a flashlight. He the, These are the things that he sees. Uh, he trips. He sees someone lying under a rug. Uh, he asks this sleeping soldier for directions, right? And looking for headquarters. Uh, but when he kicks the soldier, he realizes that the soldier has died. Agony died, uh, whose eyes yet wore agony dying hard 10 days before. So the dude is dead. Uh, he keeps on going until he finds a shafted stair. Shaft is like a mine shaft, like an opening to the surface. So he finds a stairway back to the surface. Um, well, the, not the surface, but like to uh, an open air trench. So still slightly underground. Uh, so even when he reaches the end of the tunnel, uh, he still hears the dazed muttering creatures underground who hear the boom of shells in muffled sound. So uh, if his journey through the tunnel is a hell, when he leaves hell, he simply reaches another kind of hell where his fellow soldiers are still uh, suffering under the bombardment of artillery. They are dazed and muttering creatures. So OK, we have this image, right? He goes through a tunnel. Uh, he sees terrible things, and when he reaches the end of the tunnel, there are even more terrible things. Um, so what does this add? The fact that it is a specific location on a specific day. Well, first of all, um, we know that Sassoon mostly writes from his personal experience or the personal experiences of his fellow soldiers. So this adds detail. This tells the reader at home that this is not just another general fantasy, 
that this actually happened in a specific time in a specific place. Um, so it sort of works with the fact that this description looks like he calls it a hell. Uh, we know that hell is more religious, more uh, mythological. We don't usually talk about hell in daily life. Um, so the poem itself, especially this last stanza, right? You have things like Dawn's ghost to describe the daylight. This last stanza is uh, not as realistic as the previous two stanzas. Uh, so by adding this detail at the front, it reminds us that this is supposed this is as real as the poet can imagine. Um, there is no better way to describe this scene than to call it a kind of hell. Um, right, so that's the first question. Uh, if we didn't have this line about the time and the place. Um, you know, the First World War is not the only war to use trenches. It's the most famous war to use trenches, and it's probably one of the last wars to use trenches. But there have been smaller uh, battles before 1914 that also used trench warfare. So by adding uh, this line, it also tells us that this is specifically from the First World War. Um, so without this line, the poem grows more vague. Um, harder to connect to a historical situation. Harder to connect to some person's uh, personal experience. Um, yeah, so. Um, it, when we read the other poems this week, a lot of them are general situations. Um, but here this is a specific situation that this specific soldier um, found this specific dead guy in a tunnel that felt like hell. So this detail adds to the power of the poem. OK. Let's move on to the next question. The general views death as a weapon wielded by officers against infantry. Why do you think this might be important? Um, so, OK, so let, first let's take a look at this poem, the general. Good morning, good morning, the general said when we met him last week on our way to the line. So. We here is soldiers that have not yet fought in a battle. These are new soldiers. Right? They're on their way to the front line. Now the soldiers he smiled at are most of them dead. And we're cursing his staff for incompetent swine, which means we're calling them incompetent pigs. Here's a cheery old card, grunted Harry to Jack. Old card just means a dude, a guy. As they slogged up to Eris with rifle and pack. Eris, I'm going to guess, is a place of fighting. A city in northern France in the front line through much of the war. Uh, right, so it's a place of fighting. But he did for them both by his plan of attack. To do for someone in British English means to to trap them, to to uh, hurt them, to kill them, uh, to set a trap for them. So this poem, the first half is saying, uh, you know, the general is it looks cheerful, he sounds cheerful, um, but most of the soldiers that he greets die. So that's already very tragic, right? Like think about you're walking through a camp and you look at all of these new young men who joined the army and most of them will die. Um, 
And so because most most of them will die, uh, the people who are left are you know very mad at this general for having such a terrible strategy uh, that leads so many of their fellow soldiers to die. But it says here that uh, the, the general had his revenge using his plan of attack, which means his strategy uh, kills many more soldiers. And this poem is uh, looking at this strategy as the general's revenge against these soldiers who are insulting him. I mean, it's it's not, of course, the general, uh, I'm sure, wants to win the war very badly. But the poem is setting up this opposition between uh, the officers and the general versus uh, the ordinary soldiers. Um, so the question, um, why do you think this might be important? Uh, because of course we, we hope that in an army, the soldiers will trust and follow the officers and the officers will not waste the lives of their soldiers. But here we see that because of the officers terrible strategies, soldiers keep dying for no good reason. Um, and so instead of fighting together, now we have the officers and the soldiers against each other. This is terrible for morale, Sichi. You can't get an army to fight well if they're always insulting each other and mistrusting uh, each other, the soldiers and the officers. This uh, opposition between officers and soldiers is also um, an older idea of war because uh, traditionally the officers were mostly like nobles, upper class people, rich people, and the ordinary soldiers are usually like lower class people, younger or uh, minorities. Even today, the US Army, when it recruits soldiers, it mostly tries to recruit uh, like young 18 year old men and women who uh, are not doing very well at school, have a hard time finding jobs, uh, even recruiting like black people, Latino people, um, to, to tell them, you know, in the army, everybody is fairly treated. There's no prejudice. There's no discrimination in the army. Uh, so even today, the US Army tries to find soldiers, ordinary soldiers uh, from lower classes of people. Um, so this opposition between officers and soldiers is kind of traditional. The difference here is that uh, we know that the general is not actually uh, setting a trap for his own soldiers. We know that he's simply incompetent, doesn't have a good fighting strategy. Uh, that's the irony of this poem, right? It looks like a traditional opposition between officer and soldier, but in fact, it's simply because the officers are too stupid. Um, and in a, in a way, the second case of the stupid officers is even worse than the first case of officers versus soldiers. Uh, because in the first case, you know that um, if we could somehow get the officers and soldiers to get along with each other, then they might improve uh, how they fight the war. But here the officers are so stupid, no matter how well they get along with the soldiers, it still seems like there's no good way to win this war or even to fight this war. So the irony is taking a traditional uh, situation and uh, applying wow. it to this new situation that is, uh, it looks similar, but is in fact completely different and much worse. OK. Um, Let's move on to the th third question. Why do you think glory of women ends by addressing a German mother? OK, so remember in poetry, 
um, you have the speaker, the person who is telling the poem. And sometimes you have the addressee, the person who is listening to the speaker. So here in this poem, the you is the person that the speaker is talking to. And in this line, we see that the you is a German mother. Well, no, the you is the British mother. Um, but in the last three lines, the poem suddenly starts talking to a German mother. Um, so let's take a look at this. You love us when we're heroes home on leave. Or wounded in a mentionable place. Right, because like if you're wounded in in like the crotch, shushibu, it's not something that mothers can talk to their friends about. It's kind of embarrassing. Uh, you worship decorations, which means awards or medals. Uh, you believe that chivalry, qi si jingzhen, redeems the war's disgrace. You make us shells, bombs. Um, and this is because during the war, um, because of a lack of men, all the men were fighting. Women also joined uh, factories to make bombs and, and bullets. Uh, you listen to, with delight as we tell tales of the war. Um, you praise us and you mourn us. You can't believe that British troops retire. Here, retire is in quotation marks. In English, quotation marks are used for only two purposes. The first purpose is to quote. When someone says something and you want to repeat what they say, exactly word for word, no difference, you would add quotation marks. The second use is uh, to tell the reader that you are using this word in a special way. Usually this is irony. Sometimes it is as a technical term, uh, here it is both. When the newspapers say that our troops retire, what it really means is that they retreat. Uh, so it's both a technical term and it's irony. So you can't believe that we would retreat. So this first part of the poem is sort of talking about uh, how the soldiers' mothers at home think about the war. Last week we talked about how most people at home thought fighting this war was a glorious thing, right? So this is that perspective. But in the last three lines, oh German mother dreaming by the fire, while you are knitting socks to send your son, his face is trodden deeper in the mud. So your son is already dead. Not only is he dead, nobody cares about his body. People keep stepping on his face to 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 and his face gets pressed into the mud deeper and deeper. So the question is, why does it end by suddenly turning to a German mother? Remember in the First World War, the Germans and the British are enemies. Uh, so that's the first point, right? Uh, people at home think of the enemy as like evil barbarians. They deserve to lose. But in this poem, by suddenly turning to the enemy's mother and having uh, pity and showing a sort of sadness for her and for her son, the German soldier, uh, it tells the reader that no matter if it's your side or the other side, both sides are human beings. When someone's son dies, it doesn't matter if it's a British son or a German son. Someone has lost their beloved young boy. That's the most important thing. So that's the first possible reason is to let the reader feel that any death is a tragedy, even if it's the enemy who dies. Um, Another possible reason is to show that um, like when mothers and people at home are supporting their, their soldiers, uh, again, 
the newspapers and the culture always tell them that, oh, the enemy is doing terrible things. Uh, their mothers are doing terrible things. Their culture is terrible and they deserve to be defeated and we need to like teach them a lesson, that kind of thing. But here also by showing that the German mother is doing something similar to what a British mother would do, which is basically, you know, uh, try to send their fighting son some supplies, um, thinking of them, missing them, trying to support them. Again, it's the same thing. So there really is no difference between your side and the other side. Um, so those are the two possible reasons. Uh, but also notice that the first half of the poem ends the same way that the second half ends. Right when the British troops retreat, they run and they trample the terrible corpses blind with blood. So when they retreat, they retreat in fear, right? And like the enemy is attacking or bombs are falling and so they're terrified. So when they run, they don't care what they step on. They step on uh, the mud, the ground, water, dead soldiers. It doesn't matter. Uh, so again, dead soldiers who should be buried and honored being stepped on because in the war, the only thing that matters is yourself surviving. Same as this line, right? His face is trodden deeper in the mud. So again, drawing a connection between the two sides, your side and the enemy side. It's the same thing. And so by suddenly jumping to the enemy side and showing that they are going through the same things that we are going through. The poem is also saying that all of these things in the first half of the poem all also apply to the enemy. Uh, so when it's talking about British mothers and British soldiers, it's also talking about German mothers and German soldiers. And so by jumping to the enemy's perspective, the poem uh, broadens the scope of the tragedy. It's not just our tragedy, it's everyone's tragedy, enemy and ally. And so the title is also ironic, The Glory of Women. Uh, this title means two things. Glory of women, the glory could belong to women, right? This is the women's glory. So like how uh, our mothers uh, and our wives uh, support us at home, give us supplies, honor us when we return, right? Those things also bring glory to the women. The other meaning of this title is that like, this is what glory means to women. This is women's understanding of glory. And that would be referring to. Uh, right, this part, right? Oh, you're they, they think that glory means uh, fighting honorably for your country um, and having tales of dirt and danger, like coming back and having adventurous stories, stories about adventure. Um, having a distant ardor. Ardor means passion, so like a, an emotional passion for fighting the good fight. And you can cannot imagine that we would ever retreat because that doesn't fit uh, your understanding of glory. So that's the second meaning of the title, right? This is what women think is glory in war. But it's both of these are ironic because the truth is there is no glory in, in this kind of war. Uh, OK, let's move on to. The fourth question. Do you think futility subverts traditional Christian ideas? If so, how? OK, so we're moving on to Wilfred Owen. Um, futility. I really love this poem. I love all of these poems. They're all very good poems. Move him into the sun. Gently its touch awoke him once. At home, whispering of fields half sown. 
Always it woke him, even in France, until this morning and this snow. If anything might rouse him now, the kind old son will know. So in this poem, someone died. Right, until this morning, which means, look, a lot of uh, Taiwanese students use the word until in a wrong way. Until. If you say until now. That means that now at this moment. Things have changed. So if you say. Uh, we have been stuck in quarantine until now. That means now you are leaving quarantine. Uh, whereas most of you, when you use when you use until you mean that even now we are still in quarantine, but that's not uh, how this word is used. So when the poem says until this morning, that means this morning the sun cannot wake him up. Um, so it's characterizing the sun as a kind old father. Um, at home, it wakes up the soldier because the sun, uh, when the soldier sees the sun, he thinks of his farm fields that have not yet been fully sown, Bozong. So he still has more farm work to do. So the sun reminds him that life is still ongoing. There are still things for you to do. Here, even in France, which means even during the war when they fought in France, so even when the soldier left his home farm, the sun still woke him. And it keep it kept on waking him every day until today. Uh, he's not waking up. Um, but the speaker of the poem is uh, desperate for the soldier to wake up. So he's saying, you know, I can't wake him. You can't wake him. Our, so our officer can't wake him. Maybe the sun can wake him. Every day in his life, the sun has woken him. So if anything might rouse him now, rouse means awaken. The kind old sun will know. The last possible hope. Uh, why? Second half. Think how it wakes the seeds. The, it means the sun. Think how the sun wakes the seeds. Woke once the clays of a cold star. So this is talking about how life began on Earth. Right, Earth was used to be like just uh, Earth and sea, and then one day there was life. So it woke the clays of a cold star. But this is also referring to the story of Adam and Eve. Right, God created Adam from the Earth. Like he literally took up some Earth and clay and blew life into it and it became Adam. So here it's comparing the sun to God. Uh, now, of course, Earth is not a star, but you know, it's poetry. Close enough. Uh, our limbs so dear achieved, our sides full nerved, still warm, too hard to stir. So this line means like, look at these limbs, these arms and these legs. How long had this soldier had to grow up for his limbs to reach this length? Uh, it, they're full of nerves. They're so complex, intricate parts of our bodies, and they're still warm from life. The soldier has recently died. Could such a thing, could such a uh, a body that took so long to grow and is so complicated and intricate. Could it be that this thing cannot wake? Stir means to waken, to, to wake up or to wake someone else up. Could this body really be too hard to wake up? Was it for this the clay grew tall? Like again, the soldier spent so many years growing up. Did he grow all those years simply to die now? Is that his the purpose of his life? If it is, then oh, what made fatuous sunbeams toil? Fatuous means like silly, useless. To break Earth's sleep at all. So if the purpose of this soldier's life really is 
to die at this moment, then why did the earth? Why did the sun work so hard to to bring life into this clay to create this person in the first place? Because this death is basically meaningless. One soldier's death in war does not change anything. So the question here is, does this poem subvert traditional Christian ideas? Subvert means to twist, to change, to undermine. So is it you can also say like, is it misusing traditional Christian ideas? So the traditional Christian idea here is that God created man from the earth. Um, so one kind of subversion is to not talk about God, but to talk about the sun. If you think about this from the point of view of like biology and physics, yes, it is the sun that uh, indirectly led to life on earth. So that's one way that the poem is like subverting Christian traditional ideas. Um, another way is to, to ask the purpose. Of a man's life. Um, because God did not in, in a traditional Christian idea, God did not create people for any kind of purpose. Remember, we were reading in Paradise Lost, Adam and Eve were arguing about whether they should work together or work separately. And Eve was like, if we split up, we can get more of the work done. And Adam said, God did not create us to do the work. He created us to enjoy life, to live. So this is another way that this poem is subverting traditional Christian ideas. If the soldier died at age 18, he has already experienced 18 years of life. He has already enjoyed 18 years of life. Uh, and it's true that he has lost many more years of his future. But again, the point of God creating humans isn't uh, to count how many years we get, right? It's to enjoy and experience every year that we have. Uh, but this is something that many people ask, uh, often think about, right? Why am I alive? Why am I here? What is the purpose of my life? Like I wake up, I eat breakfast, I go to class, I take an exam and I take a shower and then go to bed. What's the purpose? What am I doing this for? Um, so this kind of question is a very modern question. And Xin Dai Li Gawunti. Uh, so it takes the idea of God or the sun creating man uh, and it turns it around to ask a modern question. Uh, so those are those are a few ways that the poem kind of subverts traditional Christian ideas. Uh, but you'll notice that even when it is subverting these ideas, it is still using the ideas. It's building on the ideas in order to twist them in a new direction. Um, so, you know, the First World War killed so many people. It was incredibly destructive. Um, and it caused many people to lose faith in society, lose faith in their government, to lose faith in technological progress. The idea that uh, the more and better technology we have, the better life will become. So in a sense, uh, the war, you would think that by destroying faith in all of these modern things, people would look back to something older, something like religion. But because religion is also part of this war, uh, in the poem Dolce et Decorum Est, uh, you have the bishop saying, well, it's good to fight for your country, right? Religion is also supporting the government in the war. So when the war causes people to lose faith in the government, it also causes people to lose faith in the religion. So if this poem had been written using a more straightforward Christian uh, structure or ideas, 
like mentioning God or talking about Adam, it would be less powerful. It would not be a truly World War One poem. Uh, because the poem also destroyed people's uh, faith in traditional religion. Uh, OK, up to this point, do you have questions? Do you want to ask something? OK, then let's move on to the final question, how do you do you think the poems of Sassoon and Owen differ? Why or why not? So we looked at three of the poems by Siegfried Sassoon, right? The rear guard uh, compares a, a journey through a tunnel like a journey through hell, and it has the irony of being angry at a dead soldier and coming back to the surface to dis only to discover a new kind of hell. The general about officers versus soldiers is also ironic because here the officers are not really against the soldiers. They're just stupid. Glory of women is incredibly ironic in that the women have no idea what it is like to fight in the war, and they still imagine that the enemy is completely different when in fact both sides are the same. So we can see say from uh, Sassoon's poetry that he focuses more on the irony of war or of this war, the irony of what people think uh, and what it is actually like, or the irony between like hoping for a solution and then realizing that the solution is not very good either. Uh, so the two poems by Owen, Futility is not as ironic, it's sadder, it's a bit more religious. Uh, it's it's it seems like it's hopeful, right? Oh, maybe the sun will wake him. But of course we know that the, the, the guy died, so the sun will not wake him. So actually it's not a hopeful poem. It's a desperate poem on Drewongda. Um, so we have one more poem by uh, Wilfred Owen that we have not looked at yet. Dolce et decorum est. Uh, and the footnote says this is a Latin phrase mean that means it is sweet and meat. Meat means proper. It is sweet and proper to die for one's country. So it is good to die for your country, basically. Is the title of this poem, and it's in Latin in order to draw on the fact that it is a traditional idea. This is what people have always thought about war. Um, but maybe it's not true of this war. Bent double like old beggars under sacks, knock kneed, coughing like hags, we curse through sludge. So these two lines are describing soldiers walking through the mud. And it, you look at this imagery, they're like old beggars, knock kneed, which means their their legs are weak and shaking and their knees keep knocking against each other. They're coughing, they're cursing. Uh, and they trudge, which means to walk slowly and with difficulty. Men marched asleep. Many had lost their boots, but limped on bloodshod. To be shod means to wear like a shoe. So to be bloodshod means to wear blood like a shoe. Right, they don't have boots, so their feet are all bloody and that blood is like their shoe. They're all lame, which means they can't walk straight. They're all blind, they can't see because it's like dark. Uh, it, the haunting flares. Flare is a, a it's like a, I need to know this in Chinese. It's a kind of gun that you fire into the air to give light. Zhangguang Dan. No, I don't think that's what it is. Uh, Pao, maybe. OK, no, I really want to know this. What is this in, in Chinese? Uh, 
啊，呃，闪光信号 ，Yeah， that's what it is， 信号弹，照明弹。So because uh the poem says that there are 啊 ，No， 我不要登出。Okay， sorry， hang on。Um, so, because the poem says that there are haunting flares, so someone is firing flares into the air, that tells us that it is night, or at least it is dark. So the army needs the light. Um, so that's why they're blind. They can't see in the dark. And they're drunk with fatigue. They're so tired, it's like they're drunk. They're even deaf to the hoots of tired, outstripped five nines that drop behind. Five nines, I believe, are, are shells, bombs, 5.9 caliber shells. So like the bombs are dropping behind them, and even these loud explosions, uh, the soldiers can't hear, or like it's like they can't hear. It's like they're deaf because they're so tired. So this is the picture. They're completely tired, worn out, and but they have to walk in the night. Gas, gas, quick boys. Did you notice here the second gas? All three letters are capitals. Upper, uh, all three letters are upper uppercase letters, uh, which means that this is a louder shout. It's it's a someone is shouting right. Gas, gas, quick boys. Uh, but the second gas is louder than the first. Uh, and you have an ecstasy of fumbling. Everybody is fumbling for their helmets, their gas masks. Uh, the First World War is also the first major war to use poison gas. Um, but someone didn't get their gas mask on fast enough. So he's yelling and stumbling and floundering, which means like twisting around like a man in fire or lime, so like a man on fire. Lime is a way to burn uh, trash or burn uh, dead bodies. I think. Dim through the misty panes, pane, a pane of glass is the surface of glass. This is talking about through the gas mask. And the thick green light, this is the gas. Uh, I saw him dr as under a green sea, so like through the glass and through the the gas, it looks like under the sea, and so I saw him drowning. Um, the next section moves from the scene of the war to after the war ends. In all my dreams before my helpless sight, he plunges at me, so he, he reaches toward me. He throws himself at me, guttering. This is the sound that he makes that he can't breathe. Uh, a guttering sound, choking, drowning. And then finally, at the end of this poem, you have the point that the speaker is trying to say. If you too um, could see this scene, if you could watch how his dead body is like this, if you could hear how he struggles to breathe uh, and dies so slowly and so painfully, then you would not say with, with such ardent passion the old lie that it is good and sweet to die for your country. So here we also have a kind of irony, right? Comparing uh, the terrible death to the traditional idea that it is good to die for your country. But it's not a very strong irony. Most of the poem is a straightforward description of how this guy dies. And by paying such attention to his death, especially in these last few lines, describing how he slowly, painfully dies, the poem also gives us a sense of of neglect, tragedy, sadness, hopelessness. 
um, in the face of this kind of terrible death, what can you do? Right, it's also a very desperate, hopeless poem. From the very beginning, this description of these walking soldiers is a desperate, hopeless description. And the death later is also like this. So if we compare the poems of Sassoon and Owen, we could say that Sassoon is more focused on the irony, more focused on telling the readers at home how their traditional understanding of war is completely uh, inapplicable. It is completely different from what this war is actually like. And it doesn't tell the readers simply by saying that, but it gives you two different images, one traditional, one an actual image of the war, and it forces the reader to look at both images at the same time. Uh, and that's how it creates irony. It doesn't tell you what to think. It shows you directly. The poems of Wilfred Owen uh, have irony, but it's less irony and it's more desperation, more a sense of sadness and hopelessness. So we can say that he's writing poetry not to teach the reader a lesson, but to hopefully get the reader to feel how sad and tragic this war is. Like you can read uh, every day how more people have died and how like the war is uh, going slowly, but you don't really get the sense of what it means for someone that you have been fighting alongside you with to suddenly not be there or to, to watch this brother of yours to die a slow death. Uh, and that's what Owen is trying to do, is trying to make the reader feel what it's like to fight such a terrible war and to suffer through this terrible war. OK, so those are the five questions for this week. Do you want to ask me something more about this poetry? Or maybe some of the poems that we did not talk about today? Or some of the poems that uh, I did not ask you to read? Questions? Can you explain the number five question? The Sassoon's and Owen's question five. Yeah. OK. So um, if we go back and look through these poems, uh, the rear guard, you have the irony between uh, like the the mythological ideas of like Dawn's ghost and like hell, right? And some uh, It's not very realistic, right? Muttering creatures. Um, but in fact, this is according to the speaker. This is something that actually happened. And you have another irony between escaping hell, the hell of the tunnel, only to reach. Uh, another kind of hell where these soldiers are hiding underground to escape the bombing. So it looks like you're you're escaping uh, one kind of hell, but you only escape to another kind of hell. In the general, you have the irony between uh, a general who is so cheerful and his battle plans that send all of his soldiers to die. You also have another irony between the traditional idea of officers versus soldiers and the truth that in this war, the officers are not against the soldiers. They're just stupid. They're, uh, they're um, setting a trap for their soldiers, not on purpose, but simply because they don't know the best way to fight. Right, they are in 但是这首诗却把它讲得很刻意. Uh, in the glory of women, you have the irony between the traditional idea of uh, the enemy are all barbarians and evil, and there is nothing similar between us and the enemy. And in the last three lines, showing the reader how, in fact, the two sides are exactly the same. The mothers are at home, 
thinking of and supporting their sons and their fighting sons are dying and being uh, stepped on and pressed into the mud. Both sides are exactly the same. Uh, and so that's the one irony. Um, the difference between the traditional idea of us versus them and the truth that there is no difference. Another irony is in the title. This is what women think of as the glory of war, but in fact, what they can't accept, what they don't see is how this war has no glory at all, right? You can't believe this part because it doesn't fit with your idea of glory. So all three of these poems by Siegfried Sassoon focus on uh, some kinds of irony. And so it seems like the point of his poetry is to force the reader at home to see this irony, to see the difference between what they think of the war and what the war is actually like. When we move on to Wilfred Owen, his poems also have irony, but it's a weaker kind of irony. Uh, in let's let's talk about futility first. In futility, the irony is between uh, this soldier always having woken up every day of his life before, whether he's waking up at home or he's waking up on the battlefield in France, but today he's not waking up anymore. And no matter how hard the sun works, he's still not going to wake up because he's dead. So you can see that it's not a very strong irony. It's very weak. It's the difference between the idea that the sun always wakes him up, but today the sun is failing to wake him up. It's a very weak irony. Uh, the stronger emotion here is hopelessness. The sun is usually the sense of hope, right? The sense that each new day brings purpose, brings something that we have to do. Each time the sun shines on us, it's a new day with new possibility. But today, uh, no matter how hard the sun shines, uh, this soldier no longer has a new day. And if that's the case, uh, if if the sun helped this soldier grow for 18 years only to die like this, then why bother? So it's a hopelessness. Is this all that this person's life means? Is his only purpose to die like this in a meaningless war? Um, and then in Dolce et Decorum Est, we also have a very weak irony, right? The old lie is that it is good to die for our country. But if you look at how this soldier died so slowly and so painfully, how can this be good? Uh, so again, it's there's an irony, but it's not very strong. The stronger emotion is also a kind of terror and, and hopelessness. The first stanza is describing how these soldiers walk through the night in a hopeless way. Uh, and then the third stanza is talking about how the speaker can never forget this slow and terrible death. There is no hope that he can get over this death. And the most of this last stanza talks about how slowly and terribly the soldier dies and how all of his brothers in the army have to look at him dying uh, so slowly and so painfully and how like this slow and painful death destroys their hope in the idea that it could be good to die for your country because there's no way this kind of death could be good. So we can say that Sassoon's poetry is more focused on irony and Owen's poetry is more focused on hopelessness. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. OK, great. Uh, sorry about the late break. Let's break for 10 minutes. Come back at 3.56. And in the next uh, period, I'll talk to you about the final exam. 